Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to ask the people that are up there um, if you would also want to join us down here. So for the second part of the second day of this Footprints Conference, we can have a dialogue together with each other. And that's so much easier when you're down here. <laughs> As I said, welcome everyone to day two of the Footprints Conference, Change of the Century. Footprints is a collaborative project that aims at reforming the music sector and introducing the values of social, economic, and environmental responsibility to its activities. My name is Hasna Almarudi. Um, I'm a journalist here from the Netherlands. I'm co-founder of Lilith Magazine, which is a journalistic platform for change. And um, I'm your host. Yesterday I was here as well. And yesterday we focused more on this institutional way of changing the world. Um, and today we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into what artists themselves can also do artists themselves cannot do everything. We also uh, figured out yesterday, so who do they need? Who can they partner up with? How can they organize themselves maybe? Before we start, um, I would like to share with you that next to the dialogue part that we'll be having, there will also be a keynote presentation here, but also tonight, of course, since we are talking about the music industry, there will be uh, a double concert here at 8.30, so if you want to relax after a long day of listening to our talks, you can come back here at 8.30 and listen to Liv Andrea Haig and to Pixvai. This afternoon, I will be joined by drummer Sun Mi Hong, Steve Mead, who is the artistic director and co-founder of Manchester Jazz Festival, and drummer Jim Black. In the announcement, it said that Damien Cluzel would be here, but due to the strikes in France, he cannot be here, unfortunately. But luckily, we found Steve um, willing to fill in. There will also be uh, a lot of room uh, for you all here in the audience to join in on the dialogue, um, be it with a question, be it with a remark. Uh, if you have anything to add, just raise your hand and someone with a mic will find his or her way to you. Please do wait until the mic is with you because this is also being streamed and uh, it's important for you to talk in the mic so that they can hear you as well. Um, and if you have a question, also please let us know who you are and where you're from, because that makes the, the dialogue a lot easier. Speaking of which, I am also wondering who here is an artist. Could you please raise your hand? Who considers himself an artist or herself, themselves? Mm, quite some. Who here works at a venue? <laughs> Quite a bit as well. Who here works for some sort of funding agency? Hmm. There's the money. <laughs> and who here doesn't know why they're here? <laughs> ah, good. Well, then we. I'm sure that we will be having a great uh, conversation. Um, Let's start off with our keynote. Jim Black will be speaking about, about the artistic way of touring, drawing on his own experience, watching the scene change. Please give it up for Jim Black. Hi there. Streamed, really? You sure? <laughs> um, my name is Jim Black. I've been touring in Europe since 1989. And now I live here most of the time, although it always feels like I'm on tour still. Um, I was offered a guest professorship in Berlin in 2016 for half a year, which got me in an apartment in Berlin and situated in Europe. Uh, then I continued traveling to my address and room in New York City. And now, finally, I get to live in Bern with my partner of five years in her apartment, where I'm now a professor at the Hochschule Kunst Bern, teaching all levels of drumming, ensembles, listening classes, and I get to reflect a lot on my past uh, existence in New York from the 90s. Um, which has been a constant, mm, uh, you really feel like you're from the past when you're speaking about the 90s, speaking to an audience of people that were born after the internet 
and after the smartphone. It's a very different reality. Um, and I won't go into too much about that unless you have questions, but uh, wow, the 90s were great. <laughs> right, Ex let me explain. So <clears throat> professional artistic development in the face of global challenges, how to pursue a career as a musician in modern times. <laughs> great question. <laughs> Trigger warning, you ready? I'm gonna be talking about age and money today. They're the elephant in the room in every conversation. So if you have problems with talking about age or money, you might wanna leave or turn off the TV. Everyone has a story and our stories are worth sharing. Uh, if you're an artist, we're storytellers in some sort of way, emotions, feelings, primarily through sound, music, composition. Uh, touring, us, touring allows us to share those stories and experiences with others and get new information by asking questions. It creates a continuum. Um, to tell stories, you need something to talk about. You need to ask questions. So I have a lot of questions. I always have, and they just keep getting more and more the older I get. Um, I don't have all the answers. I have more questions always, so. I'm sure that'll be a huge topic today. In fact, most of what I'm gonna say will be a question after this initial uh, history lesson about myself, um, how I got here. Uh, I took notes. I interviewed myself. Because <laughs> I play drums for a living, not stand in front of podiums and speak to friends and strangers with lights. My brother play. But now that I teach, I have to talk, and that's good. And I've been working on that for decades, how to explain what I do, how to share with others younger than myself how to, how to do this, psychologically, musically, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm in the right place at the right time in my life. Um, how did I get here? I blame Milt Jackson. Uh, in, where I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and my uh, long-term pal, Chris Speed, the fantastic clarinet tenor player, we were 14 years old, and uh, the West Coast offered these jazz camps for kids. Um, we first one we attended was with uh, Stan Getz's quartet and Dizzy Gillespie. And getting to play drums in a big band where you happen to know the song by accident that you're playing and Dizzy's conducting the band and playing trumpet and soloing with you and smiling. That's pretty powerful in terms of like, okay, this is working so far. But I think Milt Jackson, a year later at the uh, Coastal Jazz and Blues Workshop, I believe that's probably the wrong name. I can't remember the name and it doesn't matter. It was on the west coast of, of, of Washington State and we were there with Milt Jackson Quartet, Cedar Walton, Ray Brown, Mickey Roker on drums, along with Jeff Hamilton. Uh, and every day, Milt Jackson would sit in a room with us, like 20 kids, kids, boys and girls. We were 15 to 17 years old and he'd talk and play to us. So when you're sitting five feet away from these little brown mallets with the big puffy balls, and he starts every day with a ballad or a blues. That, you don't know what to say other than like, wow, that's heavy, you know? You're a kid, but you know what the weight of that is. And you have these older people that have toured the world that have basically created jazz and, and, and uh, had to deal with all the, you can imagine what their lives were like. They're not laying this all on the children, but they would say music keeps you young. Music is this, this, this incredibly powerful force. And at the end of a week, talking about all these, Ray Brown explaining how you play quarter notes on the bass and why the drummer has to stay here and he's the head of the drummer and you have a young Jeff Hamilton saying, yeah, but it was really impossible to play with Ray at first. And I'm like, who's Ray Brown? You know, I'm just a kid. You're just trying to hang. And um, that, that's why you play. They basically told you to play. So you did this. Worked for them. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> so that inspiration, Berklee College of Music, meeting people, Frank Mobus, a guitar player from Berlin now, 
at that time coming from Nuremberg, Germany, we went to school together. When I graduated at the tender age of 22, he brought Chris Speed and I to Europe uh, for a month long tour. First time in Europe for Chris and I. After that month, we were like, <clears throat> do you really want to go back to Boston? We're learning to drink wine and eat cheese and people ask us about Herman Hesse and we know what to say. And so we're gonna stay here. We ended up moving to a house in a village. And at that time, if you liked, if you had interest in jazz, you and your friends, you could literally write a two page document to the German government and get money. So you could have jazz come to your neighborhood, jazz come to your village. And for that time, two, three months, we, for the first time in our lives, were able to pay our rent and sustain ourselves by playing locally our original music in Germany. That felt like success, that felt like a win, you know, and we were very young. But that's when I thought like, okay, this is possible, at least in Europe. Moving to New York in 91, you quickly realize this is not possible, at least where we were. So we're still working harder in our music. It's still about wanting to do this thing that we saw Dizzy do and Milt Jackson talked about. But it also means now you're gonna work for, and do telephones for six months, a job you really don't wanna do <laughs> in New York City. Um, but at the same time, that was a kind of a peaceful moment as a young artist because you were earning your money to pay the rent in the windowless bedroom you could afford <laughs> in your house in Brooklyn. But then you come home and you would work. You'd compose, you'd write music, you'd practice. And I read others that had done this in their lives where they were finding this balance between earning and being artistic and this kind of quiet because you knew you were you were keeping up with everything. Again, that sort of self-sustained feeling. And I did get a lot of work done that, that half year while I had to work that job. Soon after, your name spreads, and then I played the first Radical Jewish Culture Festival in Munich that John Zorn put on. And um, that was my first taste of an international stage with New Yorkers. Um, Soon after then, more tours began to come in, mainly through Europe. I'm now back in Europe touring. But New York in the 90s was very kind to us because you had clubs like the Knitting Factory, the large one they opened on Leonard Street, and Tonic, also showing up around, I believe that's 1998 it started? Yeah, yes, 98 to 2007. So we were playing for young audiences that, uh, at that time. Uh, you'd show up on a weekend and there'd be 300 people in the room, but you wouldn't know who they were. They weren't your friends. They weren't all students. They were young though. They were curious. And we would play these weekend gigs and make money and you know, this would happen. I think we were averaging like four to eight shows a month in New York with audiences. You combine that with recording sessions for labels when there was money, this is still pre-internet, right? So music hasn't been completely, sold music hasn't been devalued to that, to the point that it is now. But um, that all added up, plus, of course, going to Europe and earning money there because there was a demand for what we were doing in Europe. And it felt pretty, for my generation, we were very thankful and happy, like, okay, this seems pretty honest. They want us to go home and make original music. They bring us here to play. Then they say, that's awesome. See you next year with your next book of music or your next band. And that's how it was. And I know many of you here were the promoters that brought us. And thank you again, because that shaped everything. This continuum of traveling back and forth. Yes, you're creating a larger uh, ecological footprint that wasn't even being talked about at that time. You just got on the plane and went. and. Things were different. Um, but I have to say, as times changed in New York, uh, as recording studios began to close, as you know, we all know the story, the income from Europe became more and more important. And in fact, it was increasing. I remember passing Chris Potter in airports, like high-fiving, like on to the next tour. You know, oh, with this, I'm with that. Three weeks here, three weeks there. 
Okay, so fact. Most of my rent in New York for 25 years was paid with European money. That's not in a lot of interviews, and I think that's really true for a lot of musicians. Again, it felt fair, barter and exchange. We play, the money comes in, the audiences were decent. But I definitely owe something to the continent of Europe, especially the EU. I am the EU. <laughs> I was raised here. Months in France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Iceland, Austria, teaching, working with others, hanging out with families, killing time between gigs, enjoying Europe. So it's very cool I get to be here now as much as possible and to give something back to the, to the continent that's giving me and so many of my friends so much. And that's no joke. And it, I don't think it gets said that often, but that enabled me to have my New York life. Sorry, this isn't church. <laughs> How's the vibe, everyone okay? <laughs> so what do we do now? What do I do now? What are you doing now? How do we keep this up? How do we, touring's fantastic. It's a way to see the world. It's a way to meet people, culture exchange. I asked my partner the other night, I was like, if you had a gig for two weeks in town where you could pay your rent, would you need to travel? And she was like, yeah, travel's great. Travel's info, travel's input. It's fantastic, you know, you go, I mean, we, the things we've got to experience as musicians are the things families would save up years to do together. We get to have it in a day, maybe. You can do Rome in a day, you can. One day back on the train go. And hopefully you'll do it five more times as a touring artist. Um, ecologically, I don't wanna fly five transcontinental flights a month anymore, which is what it was getting to. You don't wanna to go to China twice a month, back and forth in the United States, that's dumb. As much as it was fun to go to China. Trying to cut that down. Pandemic really, for an adult like, at where I'm at age-wise, like to have that moment to reflect on like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing to your body? And what do you, does this make any sense in reality? How do you teach someone else to do this? This is l lunacy, totally. So how to make one trip and then travel around? Like it used to be in the 90s, actually, to go to Austria and stay in Austria for seven shows, to stay in Italy for seven shows, fantastic. That's why it worked. You didn't question it. It made sense. You were on the, the train. You had, you had plenty of time in each village to explore and eat and travel. But now it's different, and I'm really happy that um, this, this movement is continuing happening, starting um, better live footprints, uh, trying to make this a reality for all involved. Uh, what do we need to do? Questions. Cultivating curiosity. That's my main thing. We need to create a culture of curiosity because we are fighting against ourselves. Musicians, everybody. How outreach, you know? What would I ask, what would I say to musicians? What would I say to a young musician? What is success now for a young musician in an internet digital age? What's success? Isn't everybody successful? It wasn't the whole point of YouTube. Everyone's famous now. <laughs> kind of, right? You can be. Um, the digital era has opened up the way for so many more artists to join. Uh, one conservatory after another in Europe being being still built or jazz programs added. Everybody I went to college with back in 85 now runs a jazz department somewhere in Europe. We keep making more of us. For what? Well, art's great, right? No one's gonna ask you why are you studying philosophy? Might be harder to make money with it. That's another story. So a career as an artist, lots of musicians, lots of mouths to feed, not so many venues. How do we do this? What are we talking about? 
If I was talking to a young artist, I'd be like, become financially independent as fast as you can in some way. And I, and I don't mean constantly relying on grants, although that's possible. Maybe it's family money, but most of us, can we do something to pay our rent, to pay our food, and then do our art? Because it might be very difficult to do it just with your music. Some can do it. You might have to sacrifice quite a bit. And I definitely made, they didn't seem like sacrifices when I did it, but um, now I'm slowing my life down where I have time to maybe have a family and have time off and to go back to a little bit of a slower existence, learning how to cook again <laughs> instead of always eating on the fly. But the younger generation, the new generation, where does your money come from? It's a valid question. And I would hate to see the whole scene turn into pay to play, like it's happening, for example, in certain clubs in California, where if you don't bring in 60 people, you owe the club $650. If you don't bring in 100 people, you don't get any money at all. <laughs> and if you bring in more than 100 people, now you start to see profit. This is a couple of deals I heard recently that should go Nameless, of course, to protect the guilty and innocent, but wow, what's that? That's not sustainable, it's, nor is it fair. And actually those kind of clubs are maybe more for entertainment and not so much about art. And I guess our music has always been about, again, encouraged to be ourselves, reveal who we are, doesn't always mean you're a commercial or entertainment success. So thank you again, Europe, for always being curious about the kind of music we've made. Hopefully still being curious about that approach to art. Don't lose that, Europe, please. <laughs> Don't become just about the money. Money's important too, of course. People in seats, as they say. We need people in seats, but hopefully there's a balance. Keeping the funding, this art needs to be funded. What would I say to the promoters? Again, cultivate curiosity. What is outreach now? And I just don't mean Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's easy. And I'm afraid maybe not sustainable and maybe not even accurate. Today it might work for some things. What we deem popular or number of followers. But when I hear about a club in Spain that won't book a band because they don't have enough followers, when you know you can fake those numbers anyway, that's not a real outreach policy. Not really. No, and not fair to the artist. What kind of, what could, that's, that's not community. What's that? So outreach, a new definition of that. I want to hear those ideas. I want to know what we can do also as musicians and artists to connect with this. And I guess the idea of local community is probably the first place to look because it's, you know, this club, for example, the, this new BIM house, because I have many visions of the old one and what that meant and what that represented. The new one, yeah. It's a, par it's a new paradigm. How do you connect? How do you, how do you even reach out across to the school on the other side of the tracks and get people in here? Cultivating curiosity. How do we do this? Brainstorm, make lists, take action. In Bern, where I live, the students are quite motivated, quite, quite mixed, different experience levels, but they're hungry and they're making stuff happen on the local level. And it's been very inspiring to watch how they're doing it with the mechanisms they have in Bern. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hope wherever you look, as long as we stoke this fire of curiosity. So that's the big one for me. Um, what would I say to the public? Simply be curious. <laughs> Stay curious, encourage others to be curious, to get outside your daily routine and go experience something you know new or something you don't know. The only problem with the digital age is that it kind of kills the surprise of certain things. We don't buy CDs or albums anymore 
because we can sample them really quick and say like, oh, I heard it. Or we can go to YouTube and go, oh yeah, mm, don't like the clothes they're wearing on that band. Let's not book them. Worst case scenario. Still though, it's a little lazy. In New York in the 90s, half the fun was to go out and not know what you were gonna do. Buy that album, you didn't know if it was gonna be good or bad, but you bought it anyway. Curio curiosity, again, what would I say to record labels? Anybody from record label here? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> hey, I've worked with so many record labels in this lifetime, recording with so many different bands. I know everything. These creatures that run these labels are fantastic. Full spectrum human beings, from the best to the worst, in one person. <laughs> I mean, come on. Everyone here is kind of an artist, right? You're all kind of out of your mind. That's why you're around this music. That's why you're in the arts. So these are dynamic human beings, and um, I've taken my lessons from all of them. But uh, the one thing I would say, uh, encourage the artists to do their thing. Um, let them f have an, encourage an artist to fulfill their vision, not yours, their. Uh, don't dictate or intimidate. Enable art. Um, if a label chooses you, now let them do their work. Let them be that. That's, that's uh, and that paradigm works. And I'm currently working with a label that acts just this way. It's like working with a bunch of excited fans. That's the best. It never feels more easy than that. They do the job, I do my job, we do, we do our job together. Um, totally possible. And they're having success. They are having success in, in, in a time where a lot of people are not. So it's possible. Mm, so many things. What would I say mm, to promoters, outreach, community, curiosity? Don't be dependent on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I said all that. I might be winding down with this little rap because I'd like to actually talk have conversations. This again is, and I don't really want this to be a keynote speech. I don't even know what that means. Um, but I would say thank you for inviting me here, uh, Hasna, Carolina, and, and Matilda, the people I've spoken to, uh, especially Carolina, who asked me to, to speak. That's quite an honor. Um, what I would say to you, thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging this, your curiosity. Um, let's forge some new ideas. Let's take some action. I sit on a lot of panels. Panels that don't take action don't, don't do it for me. We need to move. Let's not make excuses and let's do something. So thanks everybody for uh, participating in this and uh, look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Black. Well, what a way to start a panel. <laughs> so we have now arrived at our panel talk in which you, Jim, will also uh, take place. So can I please invite you to take a seat? Um, next to Jim, I would also like to invite drummer Sun Mi Hong and Steve Mead to join us here on stage. The main theme um, of this conference is global challenges and artistic development kind of linked um, to each other. So it was great listening to you, Jim, about how you got to be where you are now. Um, and let's see if we can dive also into all the different global challenges that are facing us um, in this day and age. Steve, I would like to start with you. Um, when it comes to artistic development, um, what do you think or what do you believe is important for the audience? I've asked them all to bring one image that kind of introduces them as well to you. So maybe we can put up the first image and you can tell us about what's so, yeah, what is important mm -hmm. when it comes to artistic development. Well, firstly, this is, a, I think, a beautiful painting by the celebrated Catalan artist Miro, Jean Miro. Um, it's one of a suite of 23 that he's called Constellations. 
Uh, and apart from being wonderful to look at, and it's got a depth of field and shapes, the hues in there, uh, the title itself gives a lot away. And I think the idea of constellations or making constellations, they're kind of fabricated lines that we draw to connect our stars together so that they're more recognizable to us, so that they're familiar. Um, but they're also, by doing that, they become networked. They become self-connected to themselves. And I think there's something about that connection that you mentioned as well, Jim, in your talk, uh, and the enabling of those connections, which is something a lot of us do. We enable a lot of those connections to take place. So that, I think this painting, and um, it embodies that spirit mm -hmm. of what we're trying to achieve, drawing those connections, and whether it is through artist development or, or touring or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it's all about connecting people. And how do you go about connecting people? Um. Well, we don't, we're not a tour operator. Uh, I'm really excited to be at this uh, conference, this talk, to hear and share ideas about joining people together. Specifically with a, a, a festival that we run in Manchester, a lot of our work is about artist development for the rest of the year, which feeds the festival. And over the past eight or 10 years, I've, I think I've made a lot of discoveries about what's really important in artist development, and especially listening to need and, and discovering authentic need rather than assumed need. And, and building a support mechanism that's completely and utterly tailored to individual people. Mm -hmm. um, what are those needs then? What are those needs? Well, interestingly, I think coming out of the pandemic, this has been um, amplified. Uh, and I think our greatest asset, one of our greatest assets, um, is our network our connections. Mm -hmm. uh, we have them. We all know. We can come to events like this, feel really comfortable. We know people straight away. We can go get into conversations. Um, artists don't always feel that comfortable in that sort of environment. You know, not always about talking about their music either. You know, a lot of artists, you'll just find them in the corner trying to awkwardly give their CDs to people. Mm -hmm. But actually, what we realized, the value of our own networks could be of equal value to uh, the artists that we yeah. were trying to support and engage, and actually holding their hand into those networks was one of the main drivers for developing the the pan national the the the, the Europe wide project, which is called Constellations, mm -hmm. that we're one of the nine partners in. So, I want to go to some because you're kind of laughing at the idea of artists sitting in a corner. Is it, was it recognizable? Was it a, did you recognize yourself in? Uh... No, I was just uh, uh, smiling, let's say, not laughing. <laughs> just because it's is it is it a recognizable uh, assumption that artists sometimes find it difficult to connect, especially young artists. Uh, you mean connected with other? Yeah, with other peoples, with with venues, with uh, just showing showcasing themselves. Uh, yes, sometimes it's, uh, we were talking before, mm. like underrepresented uh, mm. people, you know, it's very important to also bring them, pulling them out of the pot, of course. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, getting easier and easier in terms of uh, venues and festivals, try to encourage young musicians to, to meet. And as uh, Stephen said, also like bringing like people to join to, to another part of uh, a culture and to into another country. And that kind of things are really important. And it, that I see that changing. You see the change yeah. happening in which people are being pulled in. Mm -hmm. for in yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to go to the second picture, which is a photo that you uh, chose. Um, it's not always easy being an artist and um, thinking about your artistic development on the one hand and at the same time having all these other challenges, these global challenges, for instance, climate change, um, that also needs your attention or maybe you feel that you need to give it more attention. How do you balance that out and what keeps you going in the end? Yeah, when you asked the questions, 
uh, we, we were together. Mm. And that's just that's it. Just before the the panel, and uh, you brought the beautiful, beautiful painting, uh, and I was like, "What do I have?" And then you asked, "Like, what do you have in practice space? Do you have any poster or do you have any pictures that inspires you?" And I'm like, "I don't have any." You know, it's just really like, you know. Sound, uh, you know, drums are really loud, so you really just need to have wall. Boxes. You know, exactly. So I was like, wow, what do I have? And then I was thinking, like, oh, look at my phone background. You know, normally you set up uh, pictures, one or two pictures in your lock uh, screen, or, you know. And then I was looking at, oh, you know, th uh, this might be my inspiration, and maybe more than a drive and inspiration, t to be honest. Because um, uh, I started playing music from uh, uh, from very competitive mindset, you know, uh, coming from Korea, and um, my dad used to say, "You have to win, you know. You have to be the the best, mm -hmm. you know. Otherwise, you know, there is no room for you." That kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know how many people can agree with that. So I grew up with really like, I have to go, I have to be in that conservatory, I have to play with this professor, I have to make this album this year, whatever happens in my life, I have to achieve that. So uh, there was a bit of like, you know, like kind of twisted mindset, you know, let's say at being a musician is really, really unhealthy to have that mindset and develop your artistic career. And since I moved here, that changed quite uh, dramatically. And that kind of, uh, uh, how you say, the other uh, word of saying untrusted from your parents and uh, maybe, maybe it was also not very understandable what I was doing mm -hmm. you know, from a non-musical family and try to reach somewhere that they are proud of me. You know? So that was probably my drive to mm -hmm. achieve somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know? Let's play in the beam house so you know they know probably this is the one of the best venue in the world, you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I would mm -hmm. always text my my, my parents, uh, yay! I played with this professor, yay! I played in this venue <laughs> just to make them proud of me, mm -hmm. you know. So, which, what what mm -hmm. changed? You said you when you were here, it changed that mindset of having to, you know, pursue mm -hmm. and be number one. Uh, what made you change your mindset? I think it was really uh, to see different cultures, mm -hmm. to meet different people, and how different people think in diff different ways. Mm -hmm. To me, that was really, really inspiring. And uh, I'm coming again from Korea, which I haven't spoken English before. So f to me, everything was very, very dramatic change, you know, like cultures and uh, that kind of, things and also how people play is very, very different. They have a different philosophy on music and what they want to achieve in their mm. lives are very, very, I, I was very, very shocked. You know, we have a very, very different goals in our lives, but we are on the same stage. It doesn't make any sense. So I kind of... Uh, uh, you had a big reset, basically. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also as a foreigner living in other countries, very interesting that uh, as a Korean person, which has a almost known jazz history in the country, that's why I came here, which uh, it's been 12 years I live here, which people ask me a lot, like if I am into Korean traditional music, if, you know, like as a Korean people, they ask me so many questions, which I really wanted to run away from, <laughs> you know, which made me think, okay, your root is actually very, very important. Where you are from, you know, is where, uh, what your background is, so important and that shapes you so much mm. and it will stay with you forever mm. that's how i yeah. adopt it you know with my own thoughts yeah beautiful thank you so much for sharing this <laughs> jim um in your keynote you also spoke a bit about success and redefining success or maybe no not even redefining success you posed the question what is success um it kind of relates also to uh what sun is saying how would you define success nowadays? For for myself? Yeah. <laughs> Are you successful? I'm rocking it. <laughs> yeah. No, come on. Um, I. It's funny. That's I. I got to have that traditional model of what I thought success was growing up, mm -hmm. and then I watched that model shift. 
So it's not even that you're not successful anymore. It's more like, whoa, maybe this doesn't mean anything anymore Mm -hmm. to this extent. Like maybe it's just about feeling relevant where you are now, accepting, looking at your past, taking it all in, using all of it, feeling good about where you are right now, what you're doing. What's the most important thing for me? It's still making the sound, making the music, Mm -hmm. connecting with others and sharing. That's success. But I, you didn't see it that way if you were broke in New York City. Success meant trying to be like your heroes, be financially solvent, become famous, all these things. And I just don't know if I want, I mean, if that even makes sense anymore to think that way. Mm. <laughs> Because this was you. The animal does what it does. Um, And it happens to be a, an important animal in Holland because there's hamster week <laughs> at the food store. And uh, the hamster gathers as much as it can by nature. Never, I mean, well, I don't know why it has to put that much in its mouth, but, uh, and then go running, <laughs> right? So take as much as you can because you don't know where your next meal is coming from and keep moving. Yeah, that's me in 2017, for sure. For sure. That's why it's in my phone, was it? <laughs> it's like, hey, I know that. <laughs> but but that's success, doing it, just yeah. doing it, you know? And I, and I think, uh, like, how, if everyone is famous now, in a way, you know, and you can buy a week at the Vanguard if you need to, and you can buy a five-star review from a magazine, you can purchase all these things that were real prizes back in the 80s that you had to earn, Now you just can, if you want to, you can purchase it. That's no hidden fact. Mm-hmm. So what is success? Yeah, what stood with me while you were talking is you also say, uh, talking about um, learning how to cook your first meal. <laughs> <laughs> so doing this, but not being able to cook your own meal is insane to me. Because then does success Is success something that you only do while working? Well, that's the idea of success for me, I guess, when I was younger was it was a target. Mm -hmm. And what do you do once you achieve it? Well, if you're an American capitalist mentality society from the 80s, you just keep on going. (laughs) That didn't work out very well for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's been really humbling, I think, for everybody of all ages to watch the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Just because you can't tour the way you used to, does that make you not as successful? So my definition has been reframed through the years and it will continue to reframe constantly. And in the end, maybe success isn't even, not even maybe, uh, as relevant to the artistic development or your artistic development or that of you. Um, Mm. When you came here or maybe even before, what was most essential for you to be able to develop as an artist? Was it travel? Was it money? Was it like, was it a combination of factors? The reason why I'm here is to present sound music. So that's the focus. That was the whole goal from the beginning. And that I have been successful at just for myself and my friends and creating the community of musicians and work that we've made that feels very successful. And at the same time, that doesn't, sitting on that laurel means nothing. Come on, it's an, it's nonstop, it never ends. Mm-hmm. It's constantly refining. I think what some was talking about as far as like getting over your your competition, you know? Like we always, the Americans, same thing, you're competitive, you're, and then you realize, no, you're not doing that for those reasons. You're doing this for your, this is a, per, a pursuit, mm-hmm. it's a thing. And, um, Coming over here was the opportunity to share, like a hyper amazing way to travel and get around and you meet so many people, it changes your life every every tour, mm-hmm. every time you go out and you develop a sense of community and family over the years. If I was back in the States, unable to travel to Europe, I mean, that's like, you might as well, it's like letting half your spirit go away. You can't do that. Yeah. So it's, it's completely, uh, If your life is wrapped up in it, after, especially after all these years. So it's personal on so many levels. Thank you. Um, I would like to dive into um, 
the main topic also of this conference, which is footprints and global change um, or climate change and the global challenges, I have to say. Sun, um, to start with you. In the beginning, I already spoke a bit about how you're on the one hand trying to develop yourself as an artist. On the other hand, you have all these global challenges. Um, as an artist, when and how do you think about all these global challenges? For instance, climate change. Yes, uh, being a musician is like I always describe as uh, having a company by yourself, uh, especially these days, because uh, yeah, basically you have to manage everything by yourself. So uh, what I wanted to say is there is really not much room to think about any um, changes in the world. That was in the beginning of just, you know, myself being honest, like, no, I have to survive, you know, I have to play whenever I can. And then it's been on, only also probably six, seven years I've been going out and playing internationally. So it's not been long as long as a gym, of course. So uh, in my humble opinion was, of course, I will take all the, uh, all the opportunity if I can, because mm. that's what I have to do. But then uh, uh, when the world is uh, cracking and just, you know, like we, are, we have to really think about climate change and especially doing footprints tour, luckily enough, lucky enough with Taisame. And I thought it was a really, really good idea actually to address uh, to ourselves, you know, like small changes, mm -hmm. you know. So they were providing uh, like water bottles which can be reused as well. And then there was more support for travel expenses to take trains as well mm -hmm. and uh, to make us feel comfortable within this long journey rather than taking flights for half an hour or one hour. So that kind of thing really made musicians also to, to address in, in, in the head. So I think it's really small changes mm -hmm. and uh, that affects musicians as well, slowly. Yeah. But what is it like then to take a train to Spain, for instance, or wherever you're going? Um, instead of flying out. I mean, it's also a luxury position because it takes longer in the end. Yeah, it's nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's very nightmare. And uh, it, was it Miles who said that you're getting paid not for playing, but for traveling? <laughs> I think that's what it is. And it's, it's so tiring. I mean, what I can say next to you, of course, I don't travel as much as Jim probably, but- How much do you travel? Sorry? How much do you travel? Maybe just to put things into perspective. Mm. Probably one or twice a month, just taking flights. Uh, and you, Jim? Uh, currently, I'm trying not to move as much as possible, but still, it's a, it, with flying, from, I try to stay on the train as, as much as possible. Eight and a half hours is nothing. Mm -hmm. That's easy. What's hard is traveling 12 hours and trying to play. And certain tours have had to go that way and it's driven people right out of the music business because mm -hmm. you, you can't handle it. So I understand why flights became important just, just to, for making it possible. There are a lot of other reasons. Mm -hmm. Booking a tour is a fantastic mess now. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a whole other yeah, story. Yeah, especially when you have to book your own band oh. and rehearse and all kinds of that ads in even traveling for 12 hours to Spain or yeah. just to play one and a half hour of concert, mm. which sounds crazy. Well, what's crazier is if you're in Spain and your next gig is in Eindhoven and you need to buy four flights to get to Eindhoven, how much did you make that day? Mm -hmm. Really, after the expenses, was it even worth it to do that? Yeah. All you did was damage yourself in the environment. You and know. then maybe the next day you need damage to be yourself. in Spain again. Or the week no, after. It, it, we're trying to avoid this now. We're trying yeah. to, you know, and I think if, if you are in Europe, maybe this whole idea of the three-day tour, the four-day tour makes a lot more sense, but it's more difficult if you're bringing people away from their families from other far locations. Mm -hmm. They have to have consecutive dates or a lot of financial support to buffer the travel days. Yeah. Yes. Steve, how do you listen to this story, um, considering you're from a festival? From a festival? Yeah. Um, Book yeah. me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Fly him out. 
I guess just buying into the same argument that I try to think about the impacts of my decisions before I make them. And I guess I, I do a lot of armchair travel, which is best for the environment. But it's what kind, kind of, of travel? Armchair travel. What is armchair travel? Oh, sorry. Is that? You know, Does anyone here know? Sitting at home, daydreaming about. Oh, <laughs> um, but it's also about anticipating impacts. Sorry, just need a second. <laughs> It's about anticipating the, the impacts of your decisions, isn't it? You know, for us, it might be mm. about choi art programming, choice mm -hmm. of, of artist or whatever, but it's also now the, the parameters of, of those kind of choice-making decisions are so, there's so much to consider mm -hmm. about just programming full stop, you know. Yeah, well, years well, ago, it was just, oh, I like this band, I'll mm -hmm. have them. Yeah. Now, it, it's, it's so many priorities that you want to, to present Mm -hmm. to your audience. Yeah. The, the festival, the Manchester Jazz yeah. Festival, is, um, as I read on their website, committed to reducing um, the environmental uh, impact that you have and mm. is committed to change. And how do you put that in practice? Yeah, we, we were talking about this uh, yesterday afternoon in, in one of the group discussions. And w luckily, we have some, well, I'll call them intelligent funders in the UK who, who have this on the agenda. So if you get funded, you have to align with those agendas and you have to not only walk the walk, do the stuff, but show as well mm -hmm. that you're making efforts. But I think, I mean, yes, we can all do things like, you know, I remember transitioning from paper contracts, remember them, to email contracts. Mm -hmm. And even just, you know, we used to get double, kind of big jiffy bag envelopes full of two versions of every paper contract going both ways. Crazy. When I think back to what, what we used to do and, and water bottles on stage you talked about, you know, how many of those did we get through 10 years ago? And just making that confident move to, well, we, we made our own um, recyclable bottles, branded with mm -hmm. the festival, gave every, art, every single artist one of them. Mm -hmm. They walk on stage with it and they go back and fill their bottles. It's great branding, it's in all the photos, they go off for the next couple of years and they're still proudly you know, carrying these bottles around. So, so it's kind of also thinking about, oh actually there's a, there are multiple reasons for being environmentally aware. You know, mm -hmm. It's not just the media impact of that. But I think more importantly, we can do those practical things, but more importantly it's about your thinking, and certainly in Manchester, we do a lot of local thinking. A lo you know, it's very supportive of the local scene, local trade, um, all the staff are local. We, we try to kind of think about the, the programme itself probably only has about 15% of international content, and we're very careful about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and its whole kind of raison d'etre, if you like, is about supporting an ecosystem within its immediate and, and then kind of intermediate environment without having to nod to London or a capital to actually grow a scene and to kind of provide opportunities like that. And I think that is, obviously that kind of manifested itself a lot during the pandemic where we saw a lot of kind of retracting and celebrating of local scenes, but actually mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's much wrong with that. And you, you But can doesn't interfere. it also put you back in your own bubble without breaking out of it and meeting all those different people and yeah. peoples and, and, and cultures. What Jim is also saying that the experience of travel and bringing people in is that they can also artistically teach you so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's our big dilemma, isn't it? It's, it's striking that fine balance between um, the, the kind of your, your, door, your backyard, your doorstep mm -hmm. and the wider world and actually bringing the two of them together. To the, to the reasonable extents, I think, where you can justify each decision. Yeah. And um, as I was saying earlier, we don't really do much touring or management like that, but certainly we're really aware of that with our artist development mm -hmm. and, making, and, and making maximum use of any opportunity, you know, whether that's um, being in a place to do something mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Yeah. But I think there are also, uh, there are other, other interpretations of sustainability which we perhaps keep overlooking and it's not all just about jumping on the train and not buying anything plastic there's also um, you know sustainability in terms of approaches to your artistic vision mm -hmm. and what have you set out with a mission that is sustainable mm -hmm. in the first place you know 
what's it going to look like in 10 years' time? Is it, can you see growth in there that actually um, supports the immediate environment, supports what you're all trying to achieve, um, rather than kind of tokenism and, and you know, yeah. just doing something because it, it, you think it looks good or you think there's a demand for it that you haven't got evidence for? Yeah, it's something that yesterday was also said mm. by Parvinder uh, when it comes to um, sustainability. Uh, nowadays, especially in the UK, everybody has a sustainability yeah. manager or a diversity and inclusion manager. Yeah. Uh, and it looks good, but yeah. what does it do yeah. for the next 10 to 20 years? Yeah. Um, I would like to ask a question also to the audience. Um, because it's something that we brought up yesterday, I'm not sure who here was, was here yesterday as well, um, but it's also a question that I want to pose to you guys. And that is about the responsibility of reducing the carbon footprint. We've, we've named several different actors, so musicians can do something, venues can do something, funds can do something. We need a, a constellation basically to have that change happen. Who here thinks musicians are the first ones to start that change? In whatever way, it could be travel, it could be just making music about the issues. <laughs> Can we get a microphone there? I'm sorry, I'm already just messing with the program, but... Because <laughs> <laughs> it's only one person who thinks the musicians are first. And can you s tell us your name? Yeah, hi, I'm Rogier. Um, I'm a musician uh, and organizer. Um, um, and I actually, be, be, because I'm a musician, I believe it's uh, everyone. So it's also yourself. So I think the everyone is a source of change for their whole environment. So yes, every artist is the source of changing their environment. Beautiful, thank you. And who here thinks it's venues? I would like Maika uh, to, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, whenever, you, as a venue, there is a possibility to change, I think you, you, you can do it. Um, so this building, for instance, has a BREAM certificate. It's built in 2015. Uh, it, at the time, it was state-of-the-art concerning sustainability, and we have thousands of solar panels on the roof, and still it's only 20% of our electricity use. Mm -hmm. So there's so much to be done, and whenever we can do it, we will do it. Um, and it's the big things, and it's the details. And uh, what I discovered lately, uh, it's that it's really fun to do. <laughs> fun in what way? Yeah, it's sort of yeah. It 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 connects people in your organization to, um, for instance, uh, get rid of the cookies that are you know uh, wrapped up with plastic, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then somebody comes up with that idea, and then we all think, yeah, that's a stupid idea. Get rid of those cookies. So then you find uh, you and your team find uh, sort of a connection in in yeah making it a better place in in every detail. So it's also fun. Thank you. But of course, you have to have the the means and the money and the yeah. For some venues, it's not possible to do because this whole concept of presenting art for audiences is a very difficult business in itself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Who here thinks it's politics? Mm. Who here thinks it's holistic? It needs to be all these different factors that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Then how are we gonna make that happen? Do it holistically. Jim, do you have any ideas? Well, I, <clears throat> I'm not a promoter and I don't have a venue and I can only control what I can control. Um, I have a young band. They're all half my age and they're really willing to do whatever it takes to just go out and travel and play and tour. When I ask them about a flight for one hour versus a 10 hour travel day on the train, they're like the train without hesitation, without question. And that's the first difference. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I like that. And you know, in the background, 
I mean, anybody who's my age, which is 55, thank you very much, um, which means the 80s and 90s were pretty excessive. Come on, promoters, you overspent on hotels. You really did. You did. We're not going back there, right? <laughs> the economical hotels. You book into a hotel, decent room, the whole unit's replaceable, but it's clean and it's nice. That exists now, so we don't need to waste money there. We, we can travel economically. If we can train, we can train. Uh, all those types of things. And I, I think there was this sort of like, this luxury idea, even with the musicians, like we need this pampering and that pampering. And yeah, the train, like you say, is exhausting, but it can also be fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, and it depends on the crew you're with. This is a labor of love for everybody involved, right? This is no party. You're doing this for a, a lot of reasons. I think everybody involved. It's almost like you can high five everybody in the room when you complete a show because every gig is sacred. It's just not easy. So how can we all share the weight? How can we make it fair and sustainable? Mm -hmm. And fairness is a word that's not very American when it comes to this. Not in the past. Now it should be. Fair. Well, when it comes to, for instance, traveling by train, it can also have consequences. I mean, you just said you, you were with a young band. Um, what happens the moment they have a family, children? Um, do you bring everyone? How? Well, this is the question is aging out of this. Again, age and money I said I was going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. you, you can age yourself right out of this business as an artist. I haven't had kids yet. That's why I was able to stay on the road the entire time. And partners at different times at different places in different countries. It all works together. But as you age upwards, your needs change. And maybe going on the road makes no sense, which is why how else can you make money as an artist? You know, or maybe I can go out some of the time, but maybe I should find a way to generate more income to be around at home, hence teaching, hence community outreach, starting your own venue. I mean, New York City right now is a, a hotbed of creativity for the artist my age. If you're there, you either have family money or you've, you, you and your partner are working your brains out doing a hundred different things to raise the kids and to bring in the rent. And I have a lot of friends that do this and you don't even know their names. They're that fantastic of artists, but you do not know their names because they do not leave New York. That's something that wasn't like that when I started, but now it is. And mm -hmm. so uh, you can do it. That's how you, you just, it changes over time. Traveling is not easy, mm -hmm. but it's fun. And once in a while, it's the greatest thing. Mm -hmm. Son, can you ever stay longer in one place that is not here? to play or is it constant is that travel constantly going back and forth well i think uh, the longest the days that i stayed for playing was two days i was in ronnie scott uh, mm -hmm. booked for two days as an opening band so that was the longest days which is incredibly funny because you know like as a musician as also you spoke before like please book us in one country at least five concerts we are dying of traveling, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, but it's also like there is other circumstances, of course, from the venue perspective, but that's what, what are those? What are those circumstances? Well, probably, I'm, I can't really say it because I'm, I'm not a booker or I'm not involved in the venue and stuff, but I can also see diversity. They want to have uh, different names, in, uh, even though in different cities, but as uh, musicians, in music musicians' perspective, it's a bit different, of course. You know, we are great, you know, like, please, let's, let's go to each other cities, you know, like people will, local people will come out. But also it uh, rise uh, the question of how popular you are <laughs> in that country as well, you know, how much ticket you can sell, that also, that kind of questions also rise in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's also something that you spoke about in your uh, keynote, about st back in the days being able to stay longer in a place and that that's been changing and you're also nodding. Um, one of the other things that might happen is visas, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> deep sigh, did I? <laughs> I did not know that I would scratch. Uh... I don't play in America with my bands. I can't. I can't afford to. I can't get a grant. I can't get a visa permission to play a door gig at the Stone. 
Why? Because it it doesn't even count as a venue with my European friends. This is yeah. the thing. I've I've made the grand mistake of only making the music I've wanted to make, which means having Europeans in all my bands because I grew up around Europe and all my mm -hmm. friends in America. Moving, traveling, and now America has made it almost infeasible to do this. Using you can, you can only use fake names for so long. You can't promote a fake name band. You can't grow that. So my alternative was like, I'm just going to stay in Europe mm -hmm. and play with my European bands, and uh, and there and we'll bypass the states and go play Canada. <laughs> if that's yeah. if it's about traveling like that. It's stupid to think this way, but it's, it's also very realistic. Yeah. I mean, we have to, and I guess it would take, like, how do you really change something, right? You'd have to, re there'd have to be a massive action to the U.S. government, please stop this. Or please change your rules so you can allow young musicians. The, the third degree they give a tenor player, a young 20-something tenor player with a horn, they almost try to trick them into confessing they've got a gig. It's hysterical and sad. Why did you bring your tenor to the States? What do you, oh, for lessons, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. so what gig are you playing here? Oh, well, I'm, you know, maybe I'm going to sit in a jam session. Uh-huh, so where's your gig? It's like, no, I'm, you know, like, this is the type of dialogue. It's insane. And then they'll say the same thing to the next person in line with a bass. Mm -hmm. Some days you get lucky. My Italian friend, Daniel Gallo, just shows up there like, why are you here? He's like, vacation. They're like, have fun. <laughs> you know? So not everyone can rock it like that. <laughs> yeah. But visas will, inter will cause issues. Japan as well. Shh. <laughs> Trying to go there. Shh. On vacation. There's cameras. All right. I am going there on vacation. <laughs> I can't afford to get a visa, so we're going on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a world. Son, you were also like triggered yeah, by much, me. Yeah, on Why? my side. Well, because I have a Korean passport, which actually it's uh, one of the top uh, passport that you can actually have, like easier access to many other countries, which is great. Good Korea, doing great. But um, in terms of working, it's very, very difficult, especially going to UK. Then now I have a UK la uh, label in, in London as well. And I started play with a lot of uh, people, great musicians from um, uh, from UK. And uh, two, three years ago, just before pandemic, when I got booked from Ronnie Scott, and I tried to organize more gigs because love Netherlands as well, because they have really good uh, travel funding as well. You know, so mm -hmm. be supportive. They, you have uh, three gigs at least. So I tried to book more gigs, and Ronnie Scott, which is like, okay, it's officially you can play there. You know, there is a document. But I needed document this much, just to just just to go to UK to play, mm. just an hour of concert. Yeah. And there was a, another venue um, in Birmingham which they couldn't provide me a visa, which that was the problem. So I had to take that off from my wrist, uh, list. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. But we still went there. Uh, you went on a vacation. Jammed. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. We just had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, even but then you know in border control like they are like checking my password for half an hour they're, they're checking social medias if yeah. you're doing something else you know mm -hmm. it really like I, I feel like I'm treated but as a criminal or something mm -hmm. you know, which you're not know, very innocent people you know mm -hmm. <laughs> try to yeah. play beautiful music you know but that's what you get so that kind of things are really uh, frustrating and uh, Steve, is this something you're familiar well, with? You, you asked about what could we be doing. I think yeah. the, our biggest responsibility, or I suppose people in our kind of roles, is awareness building. And especially with all your stakeholders that are part of that kind of booking cloud, you know. So everyone from an agent to a manager to the musicians themselves to the crew or whatever. And just about raising awareness of if you decide you want this, do you realize this is going to happen or it's going to cause this? Because I think most people don't fully understand what everyone else's role in that is and what the implications of one person asking or, or saying something. I and mean, you just pointed out the issue about 
Paul only being able to give you two nights at Ronnie's, but you couldn't do any other gigs in London because Paul was panicking about mm -hmm. audience dilution. If he lets you play over at the Vortex, he thinks, oh, my, I'm only going to get half my audience because they'll go there. It's only mm -hmm. five miles away. And that's because he's got uh, probably an exclusivity radius mm -hmm. in his contract that prevents you from doing another gig within 30 days, within 30 miles or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what have we got those clauses in those contracts for? Mm -hmm. Maybe ask the question: Have you know if you're being booked, have you got an exclusivity clause in your mm -hmm. contract that I'll need to right. to adhere to? Yeah. And they're usually there for a specific paranoid reason. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, but it, it works the other way as well because if a um, you know if a venue in Manchester has booked an artist three weeks before the festival and the artist wants to come and do a gig at the festival, I can't book them because mm -hmm. that venue has. I might say selfishly imposed an exclusivity radius on their booking mm -hmm. to prevent them coming to me to ask for a gig at the festival. So who's, you know, it's yeah. not about pointing the finger, but it's actually about, as I say, raising awareness with all the people involved in this chain about the implications of their standard conditions, mm -hmm. their choices, and... This and bizarre uh, idea of exclusivity, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about a few years ago, I booked um, an American um, hijabi hip hop artist. Mm. She came to the Netherlands and I was like, okay, so this is gonna cost me so, so much money. Who wants her? <laughs> and basically I pretty much pimped her out because I figured if I'm gonna be the one paying, for, paying that money, let's just see how, many, how much or how many venues we can fill with her. And it was an amazing week that she spent here. Mm. And all the venues were, were packed. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily exactly. mean- yeah. Mm. You and I know so, that sitting here. Exclusivity but, uh, clauses, no more. I want to go to the audience to see if there are any questions or remarks, um, anything you want to add. There's a question here. Hello. Oops. Oh. I'm Luis uh, Rastig from Berlin. Germany, uh, part-time um, amateur musician, full-time professional music curator. And I have a question for the um, musicians. Um, I felt sorry that you are um, struggling with uh, long train rides, which is understandable. Um, however, since <coughs> a couple of years, I, it came to my attention that night trains <coughs> seem to be more um, and more a thing again. They, uh, night trains seem to experience some kind of uh, renaissance, which I find super positive. Um, Carolina, you probably uh, already discussed uh, solutions like these during your daytime conferences, so um, excuse me if I'm late, but I would be curious about your um, opinion um, I mean, in Berlin, for instance, <clears throat> we are uh, funded by the Senate Department for Culture in Europe, which is um, fantastic. However, they do not allow um, first-class train tickets, uh, for instance. We, all, we are supposed to always to choose the, not the cheapest, but mm, seemingly most uh, reasonable uh, prices, uh, which is problematic. Um, so there's uh, still room for uh, improvement um, concerning funding institutions like the Berlin Senate Department, but all in all, um, I'm kind of optimistic that um, just because of reasons such as environmental uh, um, sustainability, um, it will be um, there will be better times. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. guess we have to demand it, of course, because I really do believe that first-class train tickets and especially, hopefully, maybe um, night train rides uh, uh, might be uh, um, an attractive solution for touring musicians. Do you uh, how, already? Uh, how about you? Um, do you? Um, is is this um, okay for you to to take night trains from uh, northern Europe to Spain or Italy? Um, or is it too much of an unreasonable um, demand, uh, like to add plus before they, a night of touring? Before they answer the question, I was wondering, do you already use the night trains? Um, or no, is it just... Because there are only a few, as far as okay. I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, it's still, uh, the um, night trains it's, are it's still developing. their baby shoes, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So th would you be able to take a night train? Would you be willing to take night trains? I've, I've never taken sleeping train uh, yet, but I would be very interested to, in doing that. And of course, it depends on conditions in the train. I can't really imagine what it is. Sorry. So, <laughs> I hope Such it's, a uh, pity that, that it... <laughs> You, you have experience in sleeping train? Yes. Okay. Once in Thailand, not in Europe. So. All right. Oh, okay. That's I thought a very it was, different story, yeah. I think. No, but no, but I thought it was amazing because you sleep and then you wake up and you're there. Yeah, it sounds very productive, actually, that you can sleep. And also for, for, from your side, you can save like one day hotel, which is also very expensive, I, th I guess. But also this <laughs> first class thing is just, uh, I don't know, it makes me laugh because sometimes we need this train trip to be very, very comfortable. And I find it a little bit funny that this is not allowed to be happened, which I feel, how about if we bring contrabass? You always have to look every stop if someone is taking your contrabass and whenever there's a, a controller in the train that you have to explain, this is my thing, I'm so sorry. You know, that's what we do for like 10 hours of trip, which I find it a little bit, is it something that we have to do? You know, so I'm very much like a supporting, please, let's do first class. We are not expecting business class in the flight, you know? Let's do this, you know? So it makes also musicians feel a little bit more comfortable and like, especially when it's a really long uh, distance. Mm -hmm. And you're really bringing important. all your instruments, yeah. 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 Have you had any professional experience with taking the night train, a night train? None? Are you kidding? We did this in the 90s constantly. If your bass player snores, no one sleeps. If there are strangers in the car, because you can't reserve all six bunks, what do you think that leads to? There's a hundred horror stories from friends, gassing cars, stealing laptops, people that can't sleep while doing this all night long, okay? so. The only nice story I have about Sleeper Train was going from my uh, guitar player in my band in 2001 was having a second child. His wife went into labor in an emergency situation. There was no way to fly him out back to Iceland. We were going from Spain, from France into Spain. Sleeper Train, 4 a.m., we get the old-fashioned cell phone call. It's a boy. We get to the hotel in Spain, in Barcelona. We plug in my... G3 laptop with the foam modem, and up comes the picture of his baby. <laughs> so that was kind of spectacular. Um, luckily, it was the second child, so it would have been weird if it was his first. But, you know, the second one, everyone says, is pretty, yeah, whatever, it's cool. <laughs> no, don't do sleeper trains, really. It's not comfortable. I don't recommend it, especially in this climate. It's dangerous. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. Unless you can rent out the whole car, it's just not safe. That's why we stopped doing it. Why are we doing this to ourselves, okay? Sustainability, take the flight when you need the flight. This is, I hate to say it, my brother's in professional sports. He works for NBC Sports and ESPN. You wanna say carbon footprint? <laughs> I thought I was a commuter. These people are commuting, the number of flights, but there's so much money being generated, millions and millions and millions of dollars worldwide. No one even asks questions about this. Yet, we echo shame ourselves for having to take an extra flight. Do not do that to us. Be aware, but do not, do not shame us into not playing, not booking, not traveling. Sorry. So, no. <laughs> no, no. Thank well, once, but try it, it's fun, once. <laughs> I was going to say, every question? train in the UK okay. at the moment turns into a sleeper train. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just quickly wanted to defend the night trains, the sleeper trains, because <laughs> I used to work actually in travel and uh, sustainability was always my great interest. I've taken dozens of them over the years and I think they improved massively, especially in Europe, in Western Europe. You can have your own bed <laughs> with clean sheets and it can be quiet and extremely comfortable. So I encourage those of you that have not try it, tried it yet to give it a go because it can be really, really nice. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> you get a coffee in the morning. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, a lot of good things about it, or can be. Not everywhere, but 
I, I enjoy this uh, way of traveling. <laughs> Thank you so much for adding that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw there's a question here as well. <laughs> Hey guys, um, Jaani from uh, GLive Lab Tampere, Finland. Um, I have a question about audience engagement and audience reach and marketing these days. If you think about being an artist these days, uh, there's a lot of marketing involved, at least in Finland. It used to be so that uh, the venue just, you know, back in the old days, the venue just uh, made an ad in the local newspaper that there's a gig and then the people came flooding in. But these days, uh, the media landscape has scattered in a way and it's, it's so much harder to reach the audiences, especially in, in Tampere where we work, which is not a jazz town per se. We have to do a lot of work to get the people in and we need uh, the artists to to in, involve in in that process. Unfortunately, I don't know if you guys like that, <laughs> but I, I want to see if you agree on this. Has uh, has the role of the artist as a marketer of the gig changed, and how do you feel about it? Is it complete shit, or do, do you go on with it? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> uh. Um, well, yes, I, well, I also, as I spoke before, I know that everyone is trying to make things happen very in, in, in a beautiful way, but as a musician, we work so much for other things, just to go play a gig and to spread music. And we also take a lot of risks, risks to get booked by venues and festivals in other country, we don't know who to expect, which is also very exciting in the other hand. But I think it's a little bit too harsh on musicians to promote themselves, to just fill up the venue and to just sell the tickets for the venue, you know? Like, I think that has to be solved in the other way, another way that I don't know if I can say it, you know, funding or other way to bridge, you know, audience to the venue and, you know, like mailing list, as you said, or even uh, organizing a bit of uh, uh, interviews with the musicians who's going to be there if you are worried about, you know, se ticket selling and stuff. But it should never, f in my perspective, and I am very active in social media, whenever I have a gig, my, I do my best. I only have like 3,000 followers on in Instagram, for example, I do my best to put my rehearsals, the process of uh, how music ma make, uh, music is making and the, the journey to, for example, Germany to wherever and sound check because we are also excited, but also in the other hand, we are doing our best to do that. And we have a mailing list as well. So it has even more things to do as a musician just to serve the music. I don't know what you think, but for me, that's really not really nice when the venue asks like, hey, ticket sale is not good, can you do something? What can I do? I'm so sorry. I'm very, very, just like tiny person who wants to make beautiful music and you booked us as well. So let's, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, it's a great question you raise. And I think like what you said is very telling. You used to take out an ad in the paper and people would come, but what year was this? Before the internet, right? Before distraction before the fact that like, why am I going to go to your festival when I have everything I need right here in front of me at home that's what I mean by curiosity so where I live in Bern New York and Berlin the algorithm knows where I'm at and it feeds me what's happening and I go and see the gigs it's fantastic however if I'm playing in Tampere I don't know anybody there I've been there like once in 25 years. So how can I do anything? <laughs> we have low pre-sales in jazz. Oh, newsflash. <laughs> yes, even, even friends of mine on big companies with big names get this. Low pre-sales, the gig's packed in the end. Pre-sales in jazz, that's a pretty new thing, to be quite honest. Although I understand the panic. It's mm -hmm. panic time. I get it. And artists understand this, and, and we want to do our part for sure. But my generation posting every move we make, not really our thing, but we will reach out when we must, when we have to, um, advertise the gig. Do we have any fans in Tampere? I 
doubt it. Why are you having a festival there with us? So this is the back to the thing, outreach. How do you cultivate curiosity? Where you're at, we can help. You, we will do, inter do interviews, we will do, it, we will do an extra day workshop with, with the local community, if it's possible. It's a fantastic idea. I mean, we're, we're down to share, for sure. Especially our generation, your mm -hmm. generation. That's fun, that's why we're doing this. But there's only so much we can do. And, and um, so social media does make a difference. Definitely, I, uh, I embrace it, even though I don't have much of a feeling for it. I know it's useful. Mm -hmm. And artists should be willing to gauge in the minimum of that. There's only a few I know that are off the grid and they do fine, but. It's probably a matter of looking at it on a case by case basis, really, rather than having a blanket approach, uh, actually looking at your artist profiles. And if it is someone who's got thousands of followers, is posting every day, really active. Uh, and they're enthusiastic, then yeah, we'll have a conversation with them. Oh, can you do a bit of co on this? But if it's someone who's got a Facebook page and they last posted in 1982 or whatever it is, it's not even worth having a conversation with them. It, you know, it's clear that nothing's going to happen. So it's, it's about targeting the approach, making best use of your time to approach the artists that are really active and enthusiastic about doing that specific type of activity to maximize both kind of channels, theirs mm -hmm. and yours, isn't it? And um, with the, the 1982 Facebookers, then we have to find another way of getting people to gig. And, you know, usually yeah, But it also circles back to what Sun said in the beginning of her being an entire company all in one. So trying to be an artist, um, also having to showcase your work in that way. Uh, think about all these other global challenges like climate change. Like, what more do you, what more can you do as an artist? Um, while you're, in, in the meantime, just trying to make music. Can I just add, uh, I completely agree with you guys. Uh, it's also if, if we have um, an, an, a jazz band coming from abroad, we really don't expect you guys to help us. It's more like a domestic problem. If there is a, a Finnish band that has a large audience on social media, it really helps us if they get the word out. It's, it's more and more important these days. And I mean, for you guys, I mean, you're supposed to be on a vacation, right? So you, can, <laughs> you can't really make a social media post about going to work. <laughs> but we do. We, we definitely do. That's part of this. It's not. It's not super heavy to do. Hey, we're playing here. Yeah, I know. It was a joke. Effective. It's great. All my friends in Berlin know I'm playing Tamper, but am I just bragging? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Are there any more questions over there in the corner? Up there. Hi, uh, Kenneth from Improvised Music Company in Dublin, um, nestled at the back here. Um, so I, I guess yeah, I'll just start by saying this is actually quite frustrating because it's such a huge topic and mm -hmm. uh, it's, we're never going to resolve in this, you know, extremely short uh, panel. But um, a couple of things, I mean, we didn't talk about the audience's role in all of this, which is a much wider societal uh, change that is required. And without that factor, you know, any one entity, organization, be it industry or artist or whomever, uh, it, it all needs to be working uh, in a way simultaneously, which is, which is, I suppose, speaks to policy as well. Um, but that's going to take an incredible uh, amount of time. But um, I, the, the other thing is, you know, we're, we're in a beautiful venue and you asked at the top of the conversation whether people worked in industry, whether people were artists, etc. And um, I suppose it's important to acknowledge that venues are infrastructure and they're in place in situ and to, the, to festivals it is the same. But artists are the ones that are the, 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 you know, that are migratory. Our artists are the ones that are traveling. So they're two actually separate things. I mean, uh, and when it comes to artists and listening to, to, to the, the panel talk about the sort of the 10 hour uh, train journey, I mean, it strikes me that the, the biggest thing we need to do is break up that train journey. And what that requires is more joined up thinking by the the satellites, the infrastructure that are in place. And the biggest problem there is that there is no really joined up thinking or a lot of discussion without platforms such as footprints, etc. So I suppose it's it's just an observation that rather than trying, you know, we have to acknowledge that yes, things have changed 
train travel, as Jim had mentioned, is something that the younger musicians prefer. But the reality of a sustainable career means that, you know, we talk about slow, slower touring, but what actually does that mean practically? Because if we don't define it practically and make conscious steps to make that tour a reality, uh, then it's just all hot air. You know, it's not actually doing anything. So breaking up that 10 hour train journey with stops on the way that requires that joined up thinking of the promoters is probably one of the key kind of transnational steps that we need to be looking at in order to sort of make it viable for the artist. I remember, Jim, and I had a conversation with you, you even mentioned that in, in Switzerland, you know, regions don't talk to each other. Right, so so that's a huge problem there in terms of having this joined up thinking to take your tour on the road on a train journey. So how do you feel about maybe sort of, is, is there any intersect point where an artist can sort of compel the promoters along a predefined route, aka a train track, um, to sort of, you know, to, to do something in some sort of chronology that, that would work? In 96, no problem. But now you can only have music on this day and this day. What are you going to do? We're dealing with like just the reality of this. Fast fix, fly to Dublin from here and work three days nearby. Fast fix. There is no intermediate journey to Dublin right now that I know from Zurich. Not easy. Especially if everybody wants Thursday or Friday. You know this. This is like... I deal with this reality every time I look at a tour schedule. Everybody wants this on a Thursday or a Monday or something. And it, doesn't, it just can't work. Paradigm change one more time? I don't know. <laughs> Regrow the local club scene. How is that possible? Will people come out every night to hear us? I don't know. It's kind of, I guess, why we're batting the ball around. And I want to see change. And there's, again, there's a fast fix. It's not, it's like a Band-Aid approach. But we've been on Band-Aids for decades now. So. Yeah, and then in comes that exclusivity that you were talking about. So if you, if they're not even talking to each other or they're having this exclusivity clauses, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question here. It's, uh, this is what we are kind of trying to achieve uh, as well. Can you say your name? Uh, Carolina, mm. to put that, um, that uh, um, discussion about actually cooperation, what Kenneth mentioned, and competition. So to actually encourage organizers to talk to each other, to consult each other, mm. instead of competing with each other. Because for now, most of the, like lots of, promoters uh, put these clauses in order to compete with each other. And I've, I've had that discussion, I think, three or four days ago about uh, like promoter in Warsaw forbidding artists to play for seven months in Warsaw. And most of the clubs are in Warsaw, you know, so and it's quite a big city. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that to put that uh, cooperation not competition in terms of us, the promoters, the community. So, yeah. so if all artists say no. Yeah, uh, I mean to fight the exclusivity clauses. This mm. is exactly what the artist did. He said, are you kidding me? Are, uh, are you going to pay me so much that I cannot work for six months? <laughs> no. So thank you. I'm taking three other concerts that I have in Warsaw for the six months. Simple as that. I mean, not simple, because you have to make choices. You have to, you have to uh, also manifest your choices. But I mean, uh, that's the clauses have to go. We all know that. But they are still there. So thank you. Sometimes it takes a third party to motivate that discussion and that change, isn't it? I mean, if, if I went to someone else, you know, venue B in Manchester, they'd just get really up in arms about it and, and, and say no to whatever it was I was saying. But if, uh, if they were part of a wider discussion, and unfortunately it's usually promoters like that who don't come to things like this, you know, and they're not part of the discussion, they're, they're in their own little bubble, they're doing their thing, thanks very much, shut up, go away. 
Are there any kind of promoters here, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a common sense yeah. clause. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. my promoter. Yeah. We had a fantastic, well-paid gig in Berlin in January, and then on our tour in March, they wanted to book us at a club, and I said, <clears throat> is that cool with the yeah. other gig we have in January? And she's like, oh. So we didn't do that gig in March in Berlin. Of course. That's common sense. Two months, that's not asking for so much, but seven months, well, come on, mm. come on. That was just mm. seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Some people if there, that. Yeah. I want to look at the audience for one final question, if there is any. Mm. No? Okay, well, then Carolina Yusvet, and I would also like to invite you out here on stage. Please give it up for Carolina. Hey. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this beautiful discussion. It is so important to us to hear your voices uh, as promoters and uh, artists. Actually, I remember once I was sending a, a band to America, and that was also a question of what it means to be successful in the eyes of different people, right? And then they ask us, you know, to prove that the band is successful. Sorry. And we were like, so what do you mean, successful? Do they have Wikipedia page? Okay, <laughs> they are successful. So, <laughs> but of course it costed so much. And it was just, uh, so also, I know this band is just not traveling to US anymore because it's not possible, it's not feasible. But also I, I really want to uh, relate to San Mi uh, said about artists uh, having so much on their plate these days to actually start your career, develop your career. We are quite close with the International Just Platform. We've been working with young artists for the last 12 years. And you know we've been observing young artists trying to make the first steps, trying to uh, go abroad with their music, present music to different communities, and how hard it is mm. yet to now put this burden on their shoulders. Okay, but you know also be sustainable now. Think about that. Of course, this is our own um, res like res responsibility as human beings. But this is your job. You're doing your job. If I can add something that, of course, it's not like there are so many people who work, who are working for musicians as well, uh, in terms of management and tour management as well. You know, I really admire these people who works. But as a musician, when you are offered a certain amount of fee to share with those people, are also a problem. So it's really not easy to even approach to them mm -hmm. because we have no money. Yeah. And 99% of the young de uh, developing musicians cannot afford what you're mm -hmm. saying. And we have someone also, to help them. Yes, there's also fund for it that we can apply for having technicians which save so much time when we have to sound check. You know, it, like really, it changes the world, yep. you know. And uh, also having tour management is, uh, tour managers are so important because then you are not exhausted before you went to the stage, going to the stage, which it happens to, happens to me so many times that I'm so exhausted, exhausted and burned out on the stage that I don't want to play music anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I reached that moment, but then I'm playing for fun. Uh, like, for example, I'm playing with my quintet for like six years, and we've been uh, pretty <laughs> successful because we play uh, a lot of gigs, like more than 25 gigs a year, which is quite a lot of uh, numbers as a one band to play a, gigs, a couple of gigs. But then, uh, applying fund and we didn't succeed already two, three times. And who are you giving, you know, like, who's the one who gets this money? You know, of course, there are many uh, fantastic artists and stuff, but I was just, you know, like, as a musician who plays so many gigs, you know, please help us out, you know. And this is exactly, I remember having this discussion with one of the artists that was a part of International Just Platform. And uh, this was a young artist, because this is again, again what you said, Jim, there is a huge sensitivity and awareness among young people about sustainability, about what we are doing and if it's the right direction. And I remember this, uh, this young artist told me that he, that was uh, a, a male artist, and, and his colleagues, they don't feel that they have a right to continue doing their job, to continue being a musician because 
to be an artist from this particular country, it requires international traveling because there's not enough venues in this in this country, it's not enough for them to sustain themselves. They have to travel internationally. And they said that they felt an inner conflict and that they, that they know that uh, uh, they, they feel that they shouldn't pursue their career. And of course, question whether they should do this job or not. And that's the question that I'm always, uh, that I'm coming back to this conversation, but because this is a question that we should ask ourselves as promoters, do we really want to lose these young artists? Do we really want them to leave the circle because of uh, this anxiety, this ecological anxiety? So here with our community and with the promoters, we are actually working so that these artists can continue doing their job. Because this is work, this is job. It can be fun, it can be exciting, you're meeting new people, but this is also work in order to be able to sustain themselves and your families. And also the question of what does success mean these days in our community, I think it's for artists, okay, I can pay my rent, I can pay my food, this is success. So, um, just to, I just wanted to wrap up very quickly uh, and start it on this because I think it's, that's why we are always bringing this aspect to the discussion about sustainability. We, can, we have to uh, always remember about these two directions that, we, that are so important to us, uh, the, the, the transition, uh, the ecological responsibility, uh, our task as our generation to do something but at the same time, to remember about uh, the actors of the sector, the most vulnerable, very often, actors of the, se of the sector, the young artists trying to set their careers, trying to work, trying to move around in order to, to make their living. Um, and uh, I think that the, the Footprints project is Thank you very much. We are coming to an end slowly of this conference. Also, we are coming uh, to an end of the Footprints uh, project itself. Uh, it has been set in quite a turbulent time. I remember when we were designing and preparing the Footprints project with Pierre Dujlet, uh, still in 2019, uh, and that was quite a different time. Uh, so that was still in the pre-pandemic time when did we decided to focus this initiative on two things that were of most interest to us, meaning ecological transition and artistic development and the support for the development of artistic careers. Um, and uh, a few months later, the pandemic started and it has, uh, yeah, it has shaken everything that we knew. It has, uh, our world that we knew ceased to exist. Our certainties ceased to exist. Um, but also that time has shown us very acutely what it means and how the world could look like if we continue like before. Uh, if we continue disregarding the climate crisis, what we are doing, what our activities, what are the consequences of our activities, how the world could look like. When we are closed in our bubbles, where we cannot go to the concerts, when we cannot meet our families, uh, where we cannot travel or work. And I think many of us have asked this question ourselves, this question, is it really a world that we want to live in? Uh, and on top of that, that's footprints, two years of footprints, quite a turbulent uh, background. On top of that, 10 days ago, we witnessed uh, a year since uh, the Russian invasion on Ukraine. And that has additionally shaken our grounds. You know, we, we believed that in Europe uh, there is peace. And we know it, now it's so fragile that everyone, I think, starts thinking about that. So. These two things, and on the, 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 the Russian invasion on Ukraine and the energy crisis that it has caused and it has influenced our daily lives as organizers, you know, being not able to, to continue functioning as, as institutions because of, uh, of uh, the energy crisis, it has also 
introduce the additional awareness among people about their energy consumptions, about the, the world order, the dependency on the, on the non-democratic regimes, etc., etc. Uh, so, yes, these two years have shown us that the direction we've taken still in 2019 is a, is a it's, a, it's a more necessary than ever. It's not, no longer an option, it's, it's an obligation that we have as, uh, as generations. Um, so yes, we have to start uh, acting towards more impactful reforms. Uh, we have to act, but at the same time, we have to, uh, music, and artists are essential for our world to be a better place. So we need to remember about their needs, about their reality, uh, and we need to take both of these factors into account while we are trying to do something as, uh, as a community. Um, so, yeah, I just uh, I remember this quote, and it's always coming back uh, of the Financial Times. I think it's just that we, the journalists from Financial Times, that we stop treating uh, the uh, climate crisis as a heart, as a as a headache, and we start to treating it as a as a heart attack. But I'm always asking, so what does it mean to to cure a heart? So. That's what we want to do in Better Life, in the new project that we are doing. We want to we wanna cure the heart by restoring the flows, the blood flows, by, um, by re reinvigorating uh, the flows between the organizers in Europe. Uh, so I want to thank, uh, first of all, our wonderful hosts, uh, Maker, and Frank and the whole team and the technicians and the production team. I want to thank the wonderful team of uh, Periscope that uh, managed to pull uh, this conference together with uh, Bim Hus. Uh, it's always saying that's my favorite team in the world and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna stay like that. I want to thank uh, all our guests and experts and speakers and everyone that has devoted this time to be with us uh, during these two super inspiring and exciting days. So we will continue uh, today with uh, great concerts. So thank you. Thank you. Well then, in conclusion, of course, also thank you to the three of you, Steve Mead, Sun Mi Hong, and Jim Black, and to the audience for being here with us today. Um, this means that this uh, second day has come to an end, um, and as uh, Carolina said, tonight there will be a, a double concert again, so please do come back at 8.30. Right here, we're going to be listening to Liv Andrea Heg, who is part of the Footprint Stores, and also to Pixwey. Uh, and uh, there's also a late night performance for those who uh, still want more. Um, that is by Purple is the Color, a band from Vienna, and that will be in the Ruimte at 11 o'clock. So, my name is Hasna Almarudi, and I hope to see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Hasna. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>